And we've got a question now from Otmar Schwartz. Um, looking at UK, the UK from outside, the political discussions look very much uh, like discussions of past issues. Socialism, national greatness, who will they do that to advance society as a whole? Um, who are the leaders that will perform jobs that used to be performed by unwanted EU workers? So it's an issue about being enthralled with the past, I guess. I think if one tries to look at the challenges that are, will be faced by any party trying to govern this country over the longer term, um, clearly one of those challenges is um, how in an aging society, and one in which the number of people who uh, go into the labor market on leaving secondary education is going down all the time because more and more then proceed to further and tertiary education. How is the country going to ensure that it has a large enough base of workers who generate wealth that will support the increasing number of people who as a result of medical advance live for a longer age and need social care. That's one big challenge for all modern society. Um, one way of doing this is to replenish the population with immigrants from elsewhere. If you are looking at society from this detached point of view, this is one obvious way of doing it. If you are on the ground, at home, then you don't think in these terms. You think of immigrants, even if you're not thinking of them in a kind of racist way, uh, you think of sudden increases in the population in your local community as putting pressure um, on uh, local schools, local hospitals, uh, uh, local surgeries on the housing uh, on the housing stock or as depressing uh, uh, or as depressing wages. So you see sudden increases in the number of immigrants in the community as a problem and not as a contribution to solving some party's long-term problems. And I, you know, it takes politicians of some skill and courage, it seems to me, to uh, provide the leadership that gets the population to understand what the connection is between immigration on the one hand and the future of a society on, uh, on, uh, on the other. And I think not many politicians uh, uh, do that. Um, leavers certainly don't do that. Uh, politicians, you can think of politicians as being entrepreneurs who are always looking for a market of votes and there has been a potent market of votes uh, for an anti-immigrant uh, policy and anti-immigrant um, uh, uh, rhetoric. So um, the question, you know, who, who will perform the jobs that used to be performed by unwanted EU workers? Well, that's a very good question. The current answer is, and this is really ironic, is that although immigration from the EU has definitely gone down since Brexit, immigration from outside the EU has gone up and gone up very significantly. Now the people, some of the people who voted leave and voted leave on the issue of immigration assumed that if we left the EU, there would be an overall reduction in the number of immigrants. And in particular, they assumed, because they didn't really understand how the EU worked, that there would be a reduction of immigration from non-EU countries, in particular from the Middle East and from uh, South Asia and, and so on. The opposite has happened. It's, it's one of a number of examples of how Brexit has produced the opposite of what its proponents claimed would happen. And this, it's very clear from the immigration figures that we're taking many more now from West Africa, from the Middle East, um, from the Far East, 
than we did before, and we're taking fewer from Europe, even though if your interest, if your concern is about social solidarity and integration, it's much easier to integrate immigrants from Europe than it is to integrate immigrants from very much more different cultures. And, we, and you saw an example of this from the response of British society to the Ukraine refugee crisis, where there was an outpouring of sympathy for the Ukrainians. And frankly, one of the reasons is, I think, that it's much easier for people to identify with Ukrainians who are much culturally much more similar to us than would be true of people, say, from Syria. Is politics now too complex for politicians to communicate, particularly given how short-term Parliament's view matters? I think it is difficult to communicate some of the complexities and dilemmas that governments face. Um, I think I said at the beginning of my talk that I've written a book on uh, domestic policy failures. Um, and when I wrote this book, I, I came to recognize that uh, policy making is difficult, good, good government is very difficult. Uh, very often governments don't have all the information they need at their disposal, or very often the arguments for and against a particular policy initiative are quite finely balanced, and you have to make a judgment call, you may not always get it right. Sometimes governments have got to take decisions in a great hurry. Uh, they just have to, uh, the matter is very urgent, and, 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 and they can get it wrong. So um, it's very easy to be wise in hindsight. But a lot of policy issues are indeed complex. There are many more dimensions to them than people realize. There are many more sides to the argument than people realize. And voters who are busy with their own lives, I think, don't want to be burdened with being told what all of these complexities um, are. What I think the implication of this is that uh, we need politicians who can deal with these complexities, who have experience of managing change. An awful lot of them don't have any experience of managing anything at all, um, and who can make good judgments about what will work and what won't work, and who have the capacity to communicate this in simple terms. Now, I, I think. Britain has had politicians who've been able to do this, and I'm going to pick some examples which will be from both sides of the house. I think, I think Margaret Thatcher was very good at that. I think Blair was good at that. Uh, uh, was 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 uh, was, was uh, uh, good at that. Both of them, um, and of course, they they also made errors. They made mistakes. Uh, but they saw their job as listening to, paying attention to the complexities and the nuances of, of policy dilemmas, coming to a view about what ought to be done, and then explaining in fairly simple and, and, and clear terms, but not in misleading terms, what it was they wanted to do and what was uh, possible. Um, Theresa May, I think, was someone else who was good at understanding and analyzing policy complexities, but she was not good at communicating them to the public. She was not a natural community, uh, communicator. It, it's, I think Johnson is, a, in some ways, a brilliant communicator, but I think he's frankly hopeless at, at, at um, understanding or even appreciating or caring about the, the, the genuine and serious dilemmas and trade-offs that policymakers have got to um, have got to manage. And this is why he relies so much on what you might call boosterism and bluster and um, uh, making people feel good about the future, even though it's not really based on any serious analysis of 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 of, of the position that the country um, is in. The, 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 the short-termism of politicians 
uh, is a serious source of bad governance in this country. Um, ministers keep their cabinet posts for two or three years, junior ministers for even less. They all want to make their mark in a short amount of time. Um, this means that uh, policy initiatives that are not going to bear fruit for many years by the very nature of what they are, are, do not, are not very attractive to politicians because they're not going to get the credit if they turn out to be correct. And they, you know, there are quite a lot of things that we, there are quite a lot of, ask, there are quite a, some, there are some a dimension of bad government is not making mistakes, in other words, taking initiatives which turn out not to work, but of never actually coming to handle a difficult issue. And we find this with social care, we find this with airport capacity, energy, if you're a nuclear energy policy, quite a number of really difficult issues where even if you get the policy right, you're not going to get the credit for it because it will take 10 years or 15 years or 20 years for it to all come right. And we're very, very bad, I think, in this country at managing issues of that nature. Do, do you think it really had very much effect on the results of the referendum, um, the, the funding that particular groups um, like Farage and people like that, that they, they had to influence people through social media? I doubt it. I, I rather doubt if it made that much difference, it made a decisive difference. I think it was an interesting reflection of the willingness of some elements of the Leave campaign to uh, take money from dubious sources. Mm. And I, I, I think there is some evidence that um, foreign countries, in particular uh, Russia, uh, were trying to uh, influence the, the, the referendum result and indeed to try to influence the democratic process because they see it in their geopolitical interests for the EU to break up. Uh, but if, if the Leave campaign had not received any of that funding, I'm not convinced that the result would have been would would have been would would, would have been that would 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 have been that different. I think it was a useful bit of money to have for them, and I think it says something about you know their outlook on politics that they took the money. Um, but I don't think that alone that alone made a critical difference. Not, not even though the result was quite, was quite small. Yeah. I mean, it does sound as if um, there was a great deal of um, targeting particular groups with, um, with this type of messages. Um, they, they managed to identify uh, the groups that they wanted to influence and get at them directly. Yes, I, I, I think, think that was definitely something that came over from the states wasn't it that, that I, can't right. remember, I can't remember the name of the, <laughs> the organization right. Cambridge yeah. Analytics I think that's oh right. that's it yeah yeah, yeah. that's right I, yes I mean modern modern campaigning is quite manipulative and they use the social media and the um, the demographic and political profiles and cultural profiles that the social media can provide to target messages to quite specifically defined groups. Of course, this is a technique that's available to, to campaigners on any side of an issue. So it's not confined to the, to, uh, uh, to the Leave campaign. And I expect that political parties will, I mean, they have done it in the past and I expect that they will do it increasingly in, uh, in Future ele in, in, in future elections. Um, and it's a bit scary, I, I, I would agree. It, it, but, but I think that, um, I think it's very easy for people who are very interested in politics, as I suspect everybody this evening is, to overestimate the amount of attention that most voters pay to political messages. Mm. Um, most voters 
I'm actually not interested in politics. They don't pay a great deal of attention to it. Uh, they, they, they look up at election time and take in a few messages and watch a few things on television, but they don't, they don't. They don't follow it on a day-to-day -day basis. I, 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 think, I think it's easy to overestimate the impact of the social media and indeed the press as well. Everybody thinks that you know, the Mail and the Express and the Sun and so on are very, very influential. I think they were. I think they 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 did exert some influence in the past. They have much smaller readerships now than they used to. Um, people take their news from a wide variety of sources. Uh, any of you who have got children or grandchildren under the age of thirty will know that they don't read newspapers any longer at all. And even if they're interested in politics, take their news from YouTube, Twitter. TikTok, Facebook, and, and so on. And again, in a rather um, haphazard uh, 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 way. So uh, I, I think it's easy to overestimate the impact of these, of these campaign techniques. And remember, the, the, the people who engage in these uh, campaign approaches. I mean, they're commercial businesses and they sell their approach to the parties and get a lot of money from the parties because they persuade the parties that they are um, effective. So they are going to hype up the impact of what they're doing. Uh, the current government is uh, talking about uh, deporting uh, asylums, new asylum seekers to Rwanda. Does, is this more fitting into the leave view of things rather than a conservative view of things? I, I think it is. Um, in a number of different ways. The Conservative Party remains very frightened of being outflanked on the right by uh, right-wing nationalist populist parties and movements such as UKIP, the Brexit party and now I think it's called the Reform Party and the control of immigration is always plays an important role in the, um, uh, in the manifestos, in the pitches of, of these parties. They're, they're always central to these kinds of, 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 um, of, of, of parties. Uh, these parties succeed if they can persuade voters that they are on the side of the people, where they define the people not as absolutely everybody, but as a large group in society, and they Try and divide that group in society from minority groups. That's that. That is their technique. Um, it is the case that uh, many traditional conservative voters, uh, some of whom have probably come over to the Conservative having voted for other parties in the past, are very exercised by um, the phenomenon of uh, boat people landing in the country, undocumented, claiming asylum. Um, uh, I do not think that their concern is that the boat people have undertaken very unsafe journeys and are being exploited by people traffickers. I think, frankly, these are people who do not like the idea of a lot of foreigners, particularly foreigners with dark skins, uh, uh, coming to this country and not being documented and therefore being not holding visas and being here on an, on an illegal basis. It is, it is an important issue for some groups in British society. The Conservatives are aware of this and they don't want to, they don't want parties to their right to compete effectively with them on this. Uh, and that is, um, the same fear that they had over Brexit and being uh, overtaken by, by, by UKIP on that, uh, uh, on that um, issue. So finding a solution to this problem 
uh, is something that they think will appeal to their traditional base, prevent their traditional base from defecting to the party to, uh, 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 to, uh, to the right, and will have tacit support amongst uh, a much larger part of the population, even those who wouldn't normally vote conservative. I think the conservatives may have miscalculated on this. I'm not sure. It's, it's, um, uh, it's a bit early uh, um, to say, but uh, it is part and parcel of what, a, what I'm calling a nationalist populist party does. Uh, I myself am skeptical that very many um, boat people will land up in Rwanda, but we will see. I just wanted to ask the question really of how do you think the authority of parliament could be restored? I mean, I mean, the whole theme of your talk was about the authority of parliament being eroded. Is there any way of, of, of um, being restored? I mean, it's not, it's, 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 it's not easy because um, increasingly, I think members of parliament feel dependent on their party in parliament for their political futures uh, 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 and, 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 and for promotion. But it can only come from within parliament. So it can, only, it can only, I mean, it's not going to be an electoral issue. It can only come from MPs themselves in parliament who um, become frustrated at what the whips ask them to do and um, um, and and resist and and fight back. Whether this, whether and when this will happen, I don't know. We've seen a few examples of it recently. Clearly, MPs were very unhappy about being asked to change the rules about declaration about conflicts of interest and sanctions for conflicts of interest at the behest of the Whips in order to save the bacon of Owen Paterson. And clearly, only last week became clear that MPs, Conservative MPs, backbenchers, were reluctant to obey a three-line whip to um, uh, uh, forestall Boris Johnson being subject to an investigation by the Committee on Privileges. So sometimes MPs do, 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 uh, do fight back, but you are, de you are dependent on backbench MPs deciding that they want to gather, they want, they want to uh, repatriate some of the powers that they've lost. Uh, uh, as and when that'll happen, I don't know. 